So, yeah, I do like my adventures. Anybody else here keen on adventures? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about, about 10%. The other 90% less so. But there you go. Um, one of my big things is surfing. I think a lot of my shared um, about Jonah when we were in that series about my near encounter with a kind of a tiger shark, which is quite scary. But I've had quite a few close calls with um, surfing. I mean, a few years ago, I was down in Cornwall, and, uh, and I got down towards the beach to go surfing. The waves were really, really big. There was nobody out surfing. I thought, it's weird how there's nobody else out, because it is quite big. But I thought, hey, I'll be fine. So I got my wetsuit on, kind of trekked down towards the, kind of, uh, the beach. I thought, actually, these waves really are quite big. I thought the worst thing is now to go back to my car with a dry wetsuit, and I had hair at the time and dry hair. So I thought, I'll at least, I'll at least try and get wet. So I paddled out into these waves. The next thing I know, I was out back, and these waves were probably, I don't know, 80, 90 feet high. Well, no, no, about 10 feet high, but they were big anyway. <laughs> and I was catching my first wave, dropping down the front of this wave, and um, shooting down so quickly, uh, coming up to make the turn, and the wave crashed down upon me and pulled me underwater. And surfers call it the washing machine cycle because it's like being caught inside a washing machine. You're not sure which way's up or which way's down. You're kind of gagging for breath, and you finally come to the surface, like, <gasps> just see the next wave come crashing down upon you and pull you back underwater. And this day was a very, very sad day because my surfboard became two surfboards as the water snapped my surfboard in half. That lesson taught me the importance of breathing. Anyone here good at breathing? <laughs> Hopefully most of you are. Can we, can we just breathe in? And breathe out. And breathe in. And breathe out. There you go. You're all good at it. You're all yeah, professionals. When we think about a Christian faith, I think one of the simplest ways to think about it is the idea of breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in and receiving from God his grace, his truth, his love, his mercy. And then breathing out into the world this life-transforming message that we've discovered through him. And my question for us this morning is, how are we breathing in? And how are we breathing out? We'll look at a great passage in Luke chapter 5. Should come up on the slides, I think, as well. Luke chapter 5, verses 12 onwards. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, Don't tell anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. The news spread about him all the more. So the crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their illnesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal those who were ill. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew they were thinking and asked, <clears throat> why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easy to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, 
we have seen remarkable things today. What a passage, eh? Okay, I thought so. <laughs> I love Luke chapters 4, 5, and 6. They are packed full of action. There is Jesus being tempted in the desert, battling Satan. Then he's there preaching Isaiah 61 in the synagogue. And what he's saying is so controversial, they will take him to the edge of the cliff to try and push him off, but he slips through the crowd. Then he's casting out demons. We're saying, wow, what authority this man has. Then he heals Peter's mother-in-law, who then makes him a nice meal afterwards. Very nice story. Then there is this miraculous catch of fish. And we've heard about this guy who have leprosy, is suddenly healed. And this paralyzed man lowered through the roof and again miraculously healed. The next moment, he's having a meal with sinners. And then he challenges the Pharisees about what the Sabbath is all about. And there's a man with a shriveled right hand, and right in front of everybody, the hand becomes good again. Then he chooses the 12 disciples, and then he preaches this amazing sermon on the Beatitudes. Luke 4, 5, and 6 are action Packed. There is high drama. There is controversy. There is emotion. There are moments of heaven and earth connecting. And when I read these stories, I think this is the man I want to follow. Transforming and changing the world. Amazing stories, action packed. But it's really easy to miss sandwiched between all this action that Jesus keeps breathing in. Why now breathe in? And breathe out. And in. And out. Luke 4, 42. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. Luke 5, 16. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke 6, 12. One of those days, Jesus went out onto a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Amongst all of that action, those incredible stories, they are punctuated with the importance of breathing in. And you can't think, well, hang on a sec, why? Jesus, you were there, revival was taking place. You have all of eternity to spend with the Father. Why did you take time to breathe in? Why did you have to do that? I think partly he was modeling to us what it truly means to be human. If we really want to live in our full humanity of who we're called to be, we need to spend time breathing in. And in this passage, we see that Jesus was having some very challenging situations. He was under enormous pressure. He was getting attacked by the Pharisees. And the people of his hometown almost push him off the cliff. I think today, in the 21st century, we live very pressurized lives. I'm not sure how often you're being pushed off cliffs, but there are times when we're living under such pressure in society today. Jesus had immense pressure, but also there's these needs all around him. Luke 5.15, yeah, the news pattern spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Jesus was in demand. So many different needs. I imagine it was quite overwhelming as we live out our lives or the pressures we face. There are so many needs we encounter every single day. Global needs, local needs, family needs, community needs, whatever they could be. There are so many needs. Where do we even begin to start? I think Jesus breathed in to help us understand the importance that as we're living out our faith, we need to breathe in too to remember who we are and whose we are. You know, lots of prayers that Jesus prays in the Gospels. There is a Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven. There's that great prayer in John 17 that we might be one as he and the Father are one. But a few times we get to hear the Father speaking back to the Son, like the baptism of Jesus or the transfiguration. And we hear these words, this is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. In times of pressure, in times when there's so much need all around us, it's easy to forget that we are his children, that we are loved by him, 
and that with us he is well pleased as we live out our faith. How are we breathing in? There are lots of books written recently on the idea of habits. Often we think about bad habits or good habits. And we've got any particularly bad habits here? Want to raise your hand and, and share what they are? <laughs> no, I won't. Um, if you want to change a culture, if you want to change your, uh, a kind of a way of doing things, you have to look at the habits that you have. And interesting that we can have these great visions and ambitions, even as a local church, but the vision can be there. But if the culture doesn't change, then the vision is not really going to ever come to fruition. So a habit is basically three things. Next slide down. It's a cue, an action, and a reward. A cue, an action, and a reward. So in the morning you wake up, that's the cue. The action is you put the kettle on to have a cup of coffee. Amen. The reward is, whoa, I feel awake. Just me? Okay. okay. I spent a while living in France, and um, in France, it's kind of weird because my kids were in French school there, and uh, the French love kissing. The whole mm, 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 thing. And I was not quite used to this being kind of British. So I remember kind of going there the first day at the school gate, all these random mums coming to kiss me. It was like, this feels so awkward. Um, but gradually I became more and more French. I was like, ah, oui, oui. And I was kind of going for these kisses. And so I became very afraid of kisses. The challenging thing is this, it became such a habit. When I came back to the UK, one day I was in the local park, random mum went straight in for a kiss. She's like, what are you trying to do? I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to explain that was difficult. The idea of a cue and action, the cue was meeting somebody. The action was this kiss. And the reward was a sense, I guess, of connection. My daughter in primary school, in, in nursery, we had this kind of thing for her bedtime routine. So the cue was we'd sing Twinkle Twinkle. The action was her hands would go to her eyes, she'd rub her eyes, and she'd be asleep in seconds. And that was the reward, a vested child. Then at nursery, 10.30 in the morning, they sing Twinkle Twinkle. And my daughter just passes out. <laughs> Habits are really powerful. What habits do we have for breathing in, for remembering who God is and who we are called to be? See, in this passage, it seems almost that Jesus had some habits. Maybe the cue was at dawn. He went away and he was alone. That was the action. And the reward was that he heard from the Father. And the different seasons of life we need to create different habits, different ways of engaging with God and knowing who we're called to be. When my kids were very, very young, I used to enjoy kind of wake up in the morning, opening my Bible as kind of the kind of sun began to trickle through the curtains, have a nice quiet time with the Lord. Then I had young kids and I get woken up at 4.30 with screaming and that whole idea of that habit went out the window. Really. It was very difficult to engage with God in this way anymore. So I had to find new habits, new ways of engaging with God. We shared recently in this series on Philippians about the idea that, that Paul wrote about being in Christ. He had these habits to help him remember whose he was and whose he and his true identity. So in this new term, September's now here, in this next section of this year, what habits can you keep to keep breathing in? And what habits do you need to reimagine? Here are some possible cues. The cues could be, that when you park the car, you don't get out straight away, but you take five minutes with God. It could be you have a sacred space in your home, maybe a chair that you try and sit in for 10 minutes a day to spend time with God. It could be placing your Bible or a journal or a Christian book next to your bed so that every morning or every night you have a quick dip into it. It could be that as you're getting dressed, you put something inside your wardrobe to pray about. It could be scheduling in your diary an hour's walk each week just to be with God. They could be some of the cues. The actions could be listening to the audio Bible, praying for people, working through a devotional book, praying and journaling, memorizing scripture, reading through a gospel, listening to a worship album, whatever it is, but some way of breathing in and remembering who you are because the reward is we know we are children of God. And that we are loved. If we forget to breathe in, grace becomes works. If we forget to breathe in, relationship becomes religion. If we forget to breathe in, then joy becomes this heavy yoke. All of our mission has to flow from a revelation of who God is. Quickly, person next to you. What might be some of your cues and your actions discussed for two minutes? Go for it. Into action.
So, right now, when let's pause again. This could be hard to get you back in now. No chance, I've lost the room. <laughs> so right now, can we just breathe in and breathe out? Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. How will you this week keep breathing in? Jesus breathes in this passage and then he's able to breathe out. And there are three things that I love and special about how he breathes out. The first thing is the importance of interruptions. In many ways, the cue for Jesus are interruptions. Suddenly, his life gets interrupted. He doesn't say in the passage that Jesus didn't write today, let me try and find somebody with leprosy. But instead, the leper comes and falls at his feet. He's not there looking for a paralyzed man. He's there speaking in the house. When suddenly this guy gets lowered through, can you imagine that? Get lowered through the roof, like, oh, hello, <laughs> nice to have you join us. Both times interruptions. But Jesus sees these interruptions as being opportunities. One of my favorite stories to tell is a few years ago now, but I was a local guy I was witnessing to a little bit who was an alcoholic in a local pub and um, I was walking back one night, it was quite dark and uh, I saw him and I thought, oh no, okay, I kept, kept walking home. He's like, ah, it's, it's the Catholic priest. I'm like, Catholic? no, I'm just a Christian. He thinks I'm a Catholic priest. So, it's the Catholic priest. I'm like, no, no, I'm just a Christian. So I'm walking home. No, I'm just a Christian. I'm going home. Thank you much. No, 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 come over here. No, 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 I'm going home. And basically ended up putting me over this thing and there, there was two guys about to have a fight. And he's like, uh, right, listen to this Catholic priest. Let him tell you what Jesus says about fighting. I'm like, well, first of all, I'm not a Catholic priest. And I try to <laughs> explain to these guys, guys, please don't fight. The Bible says, love one another. At which point they said, please, sir, go away, using very different language. <laughs> and um, I had the T-shirts off, ready to scrap. And I was like, oh, man, this is a nightmare. So I began to walk away saying, I've tried. I can't do it. I've tried. And he goes, no, no, try again, try again, try again. So I put my hands in the air and said... Father God, right now, bring your peace right here. And to my astonishment, the peace of God just came. And these two guys put on their T-shirts again and went, let's not fight, and walked off in different directions. I think sometimes we miss out on the interruptions that God is giving us, and we don't see them as opportunities to administer God's grace and truth and love and mercy into these moments. The cue perhaps this week is, is there going to be an interruption where you get to speak something of who God is? So the first thing about this is that he sees interruptions as being opportunities. Second of all, he sees the actual needs. The leper comes to him, and he wants to be healed. That makes sense. But Jesus does more than heal him. First of all, he reaches out, and he touches the leper. Now, in that society... In Jewish society, the idea was that if you were, if you were clean and, and someone was unclean, that by touching an unclean person, it would make you unclean. But with Jesus, it's different. He's clean, the guy's unclean, but Jesus touches him and the guy becomes clean. How cool is that? But I love about it that he sees the man's need for touch. I spent time in India at a leper colony there, and when you go and just hold people's hands, it speaks volumes because nobody ever touches them. And it's a way of administering God's grace by holding their hands and talking to them and praying with them. And then he says to him, and now go to the priest. He's saying to him, I want you to not only get healed and, and to, to be touched, but also I want you to be reconciled to the community again, to be, know that you are fully accepted by God. He sees the needs beneath the needs. And the paralyzed man, he gets lowered for the roof, he doesn't say, you're healed. He says, your sins are forgiven. It's like, well, hang on a sec. I thought he went healing. That's why his friends brought him there. But he sees his ultimate need is to be forgiven as well as being healed. How often do we respond to the superficial things rather than the things that are really going on in people's lives? If we're not breathing in, it's very difficult to breathe out. Jesus saw interruptions as being opportunities. He saw the needs beneath the needs, but also he had a real sense of expectation. 
that miraculous things can take place. When we spend time alone with the Father, we are reminded again of who God is, what it means to be his children, but also gives us a sense of expectancy. We expect God to move and do some incredible things. This term, as a church, we're going to be exploring the idea of how do we become more missional. And it can be our nice vision statement, but the culture also needs to change. How are we going to keep breathing in and then breathing out? So I want to give you three possible habits of breathing out. Is that okay? It's the first habit. If you hear these four knots, these are going to be the Q. If you go back to the Q action rewards, that would be fantastic. The Q is these, the four knots. When you hear these words, things are not going well. Or when someone says, I'm not prepared for this, I've just lost my job. Or I'm not prepared for this, I've just become a granddad. Or I'm not prepared for this, I'm new to the place. Or when you hear someone say, I'm not in church anymore. I used to be in church, but not anymore. Or fourthly, when someone says, I'm not from here, I'm new to this area, I'm new to this place. That is the cue. And the action is simply to say, would you like to come to church? Often in these moments of transition in people's lives are the key moments when actually open to experiencing something more of who God is. So when you hear those four knocks, the cue is, things are not going well. I'm not prepared for this. I'm not in church. Or I'm not from here. The action is simply to say, would you like to come to church? And the reward isn't whether or not they come or not. That's up to God. But the reward is knowing that you've stepped out and invited them. That's the first habit, okay? Second habit is from here. When someone says to you tomorrow or Tuesday, how was your weekend? We can talk about all kinds of things. You say, oh, we had a nice walk. We uh, got lost in Scotland. Or all kinds of things you can say. But I challenge you to say, I went to church and this happened. Just to give a snippet of something you experienced, perhaps during time of worship or, or perhaps in a conversation, that, just to drop something in about church so the cue is, what happened on the weekend? The action is to mention that you went to church and something happened. And the reward is helping them, that person know there is something important to you about your faith. Two very simple habits. And here's the third habit. And the third habit is going to be a joint exercise, okay? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Feel the enthusiasm in the room. Okay. One of the charities I run is called Share Jesus. People say, what do you do? Well, we share Jesus, clever name. And um, we've got this little thing called prompt. It's the idea of asking God to prompt us into doing things, into looking for opportunities to share our faith. So it's basically a cue and action reward. The cue is one of these cards. The action is to try and respond to it in some way. And the reward is seeing what God does, okay? So on these cards are things like, this is the hard one. Is there a stranger I could strike up a conversation with this week? Quite challenging, yeah? Well, this one here. Who do I need to spend time listening to this week? Or well, this one here. Who can I secretly bless this week? I'll just do one more. Uh, one more we'll do is in here. Is, is there a Christian book or video I could give someone to help them on their faith journey? So the idea is each Sunday morning, the next few weeks, we're going to pick at random one of these cards... And we're all going to have a go at doing it. So the cue is the card, okay? And then the action is to try and say, during the week, is there a way to somehow respond to this question? So asking God, God, this is the question. Is there somebody this week I can begin to minister to in some way? Make sense? And the reward is, if you, it might be that you meet someone on the bus and you'll share your faith with them. They choose to become a Christian, and they're so excited the entire bus actually converts as well. And you end up having to kind of lead a mini revival in Tooting Broadway. It's possible. <laughs> but more likely, it might be a very little thing you do, and that's really good as well. It's little steps of helping us think missionally about how we not only breathe in, but how we breathe out as well. So, who wants to choose the card for this week? <laughs> Why? You can read it out. Oh, okay, okay. More, 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 more. More, more. That one, that one, that one. That one, yeah, okay. This is everyone to do, okay? What conversation this week can I mention the name of Jesus in? Is that hard or easy? Silence. You want another one? (laughs) Okay, great, thank you. Right, so everyone this week, the challenge is this. What conversation this week can I mention the name of Jesus in? I think often we talk about the weather. And we talk about how bad Man United are. But we rarely perhaps talk about the name of Jesus. 
So how can we this week? Is there a conversation at some point we can mention specifically the name of Jesus? And next Sunday, the different sites, when you get some feedback and see how it's gone, okay? Got it? So this, and Carl will go out on the email as well, so everyone's seen the email this week, so you'll get a reminder of it. If you want to write down the phone, on your phone now, you could do. What conversation this week can I mention the name of Jesus in on your phone to remind you to try and do it? And this week, let's see what happens as we try and mention the name of Jesus. And next week, there'll be a whole new uh, queue, a new action, a new reward, okay? Make sense? Yeah. So that's the plan. Um, I'll just finish with one, more, one last story. It's one of my favorite stories. I might have shared it before, I'm not sure. But um, there's this guy uh, from Africa, and he's in New York. And, um, and he's walking with this New Yorker. And uh, it's a really new, noisy New York scene, you know, kind of Times Square. The sirens are going past, and it's all going crazy, and people selling stuff, and a lot of noise and clatter. And the African guy goes, ah, oh, can you hear that? And the guy from New York goes, hear what? He goes, ah, listen, listen. The guy from New York, listen, listen to what? He says, no, 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 come here, come here, come here. And behind this bin is a tiny cricket, making the sound of a cricket. The guy from New York goes, wow, that's incredible. Your hearing is amazing. How could you possibly hear that amongst all this noise and commotion? And the guy from Africa goes, well, you know, that's, that's cricket. That's what I hear in my village. I'm used to hearing that sound, and so this is what I heard, and so I could hear it. The guy from New York goes, oh, that's incredible. That is so, we can never do that. That's impossible for me. And the guy goes, oh, no, no, it's possible. The guy from Africa pulls out some coins and drops the coins on the sidewalk. And as soon as the coins hit the floor, everybody in New York stops, looks at the money. <laughs> and the guy from Africa says to the New Yorker, here's the thing. We all have our ears tuned into something. Just different things. We've commissioned David this morning, but I'd love to commission all of us this morning. Is that all right? So if you're able to stand up, it'd be fantastic if you're able to. As the band come up again now, let me just, just pray. Father God, right now, we just breathe in deeply. We remember who you are and who we are, that we are your children and you love us. And Father, if we think about the week ahead, there might be many needs that are pressing upon us. Perhaps pressures we're facing. But may we keep creating habits to breathe in deeply. And may we not just breathe in, may we also breathe out. I pray, Father, even for this week, this simple idea of prompt. May we look for a conversation at some point this week with a non-Christian we can mention specifically the name of Jesus. And may we hear stories next Sunday of what you've done as we step out in faith. And Father God, we're just thankful we don't do this in our own strength. We invite you, your Holy Spirit, to work powerfully in us and through us. Make us aware of the right cue, the right thing to say. May we leave the ultimate response in your hands. But may we be obedient to see those moments of sharing more of who you are. We thank you for your love and your goodness and your truth. We thank you ultimately for the cross. That is because of the cross we can breathe in and know just who we are. And we can share this amazing, life-transforming, good news message with those around us. I commission myself and I commission each person here to go in the power of the Holy Spirit, speaking in the name of Jesus. Amen.